Ladies and gentlemen, just over a week ago, I made a video that was how all of the Call of Duty games were connected via the Warzone story. And you guys seem to really enjoy it. I said if that video got 5,000 likes, then I would make another video that would be the full timeline of Warzone and everything that has happened in this universe so far. That is what this video is going to be. But yet, we can still take this a step further. If this video gets 10,000 likes, I know it's a lot, but if this video gets 10,000 likes, I will do a video with the entire timeline of Call of Duty as a whole, including every single Call of Duty game that has been released. So if you wanna see that, you would enjoy that, hit that like button and we will make it happen. But as for this video, the Warzone timeline is incredibly confusing and only got more confusing this year with the Caldera. But in this video, I will try to piece it all together for you guys, removing parts that make no sense, adding in some parts just for context, and you'll see what I mean as we go through it. But for this video, we have to start out from the very beginning, the beginning of the Warzone story, and therefore, the Warzone timeline. So the beginning of the story doesn't actually start at the beginning. It starts in the year 1984 in Verdansk, when our heroes, Frank Woods, Russell Adler, Mason Hudson, go into a bunker and they find someone by the name of Butcher. Butcher then goes on to tell them the story of Vanguard, a task force that he put together and specifically goes way back to the year 1944. Mission log number 113, Operation Vulcan, Pacific, 1944. I was cruising above the Pacific Ocean with Trident, seeing if those secret Nazi rumors were true. Those fuckers knew we were coming, didn't waste any time trying to take us out. I sent Trident down on their own, while I got the plane the fuck out of there. They knew what to do. So Butcher is here narrating a story from the year 1944 alongside Task Force Trident and on Operation Vulcan, during which they are flying a plane over the Pacific looking for hidden Nazis, at which time they are shot down. They are shot down over an island called the Caldera, and he sends Task Force Trident in to do some research. But what he ends up finding out was much, much deeper than he originally believed. It turns out that the Nazis have been set up on this island and have been hiding out in hidden bunkers. Now, what we find out from this cutscene is that the Nazis originally found this island in the year 1939, and that is when the bunkers were put into place. But really, the rest of this story doesn't necessarily have to do with the Caldera whatsoever, but rather Butcher and what he does. So what a lot of you may not know is that the Caldera actually took place one year before the events of Call of Duty Vanguard. And essentially what Call of Duty Vanguard is about is a task force put together by Captain Butcher, known as Vanguard. It takes place in the year 1945 and therefore after the caldera now with this with this task force that butcher put together as you know the events of vanguard happen they stop another war from essentially occurring and they save the day that is essentially call of duty vanguard now at the end of vanguard we see them in a plane looking at various files and different things that they can see in these containers in it they find out a bunch of different nazi plans which one of them would of course be the caldera but there are several others included as well how about this project nova i can beat it project ether reviving the dead <laughs> Does anyone want some Nazi gold? Looks like we're going to be busy. Now, the reason why I bring this up is because that is how the story of the Caldera and Butcher's people really continue. As we can see in Season 2, we have another task force by the name of Task Force Yeti, another one that Butcher put together to work in the Alps. This is what we see continue throughout the story of Vanguard. However, something you should know about the story of the Caldera. When the Caldera first came out, when you infilled into the game, it would say Day 3 in the bottom left-hand corner. Later on, within Season 2, that would then change to 1944 which is when we know that the caldera 
takes place. However, once we hit season three of Call of Duty Vanguard, that infill sequence switches and the date changes to 20. 22. This also happens to be when the story of the Caldera and Vanguard get really, really screwy and things like King Kong and Godzilla get implemented into the game. What we can take away from this is this is Butcher's telling of the Caldera events and the things that have happened may not actually be happening as that is when the date changes and no longer lines up with the rest of the Warzone story. So things like King Kong and Godzilla and Menendez and Rourke being brought into the game, we're going to take that with a grain of salt and not necessarily say it's a part of the Warzone story, but at least just mention the fact that at the very least, Butcher is talking about it. Now, whether these events are canon or not, what we can add to the timeline is the events of Fortune's Keep. In the year 1976, Butcher sends out some more task force to Fortune's Keep, another area where Nazi gold and things along those lines can be found. It doesn't really tie into the overarching story of Warzone, but it's just a spin-off, if you will. Now, once again, to understand the full story of Warzone, we have to go a little bit outside the grasps of Warzone itself to the year 1968. This is the time during Black Ops 1 when our characters go to Rebirth Island, the creation site of Nova Six Gas. This location plays a predominant role within Black Ops 1, being the location where essentially Alex Mason loses his mind and a bunch of various different things go down. However, where it plays into Warzone in itself in Rebirth Island, Island doesn't come into play later, but what does is a character by the name of Stitch. We are introduced to Stitch as a character who worked at Rebirth Island. He's a character that definitely had a beef with Russell Adler as he was one of the people who interrogate him and took his eyes during the events of Black Ops 1. However, as we find out, there is a bit of a beef between Stitch and Russell Adler, and what he does is sets up a trap. He lets Adler find out his plan, where he goes to a mall where he is supposedly holding Nova Six Gas. Once they get there, the trap is set, and Russell Adler is taken captive by none other than Stitch. So after this, Frank Woods goes looking for Russell Adler in the jungles in Laos. And essentially, they go there, and they don't find him. But what they do find is it appears as though Russell Adler has been started to be brainwashed. On top of that, the Nova 6 gas threat wasn't actually real. They were using it as a way to draw in Russell Adler. But what we did find out is where Adler was being taken. Intel points to Verdansk. Pack your bags. Bring our boy home. Then when we get into season three, we get a little bit more into what Stitch's plan actually is. We see a few of his men going into the mountain and retrieving Dragovich's numbers sequence, which is very mysterious. But by the end of the cutscene, we get to see where Adler is and what Stitch is doing to him. We have the numbers data. <laughs> Complete your mission. Parkle. Here. Moscow will blame the Americans for Yamantown, and our work with Adler is almost done. We can proceed. What Dragovich only managed with a single subject, we shall do to entire nations. What we do in Verdansk will pave the way for the rise of Greater Russia. So this is where the events of 1984, specifically Verdansk 1984, come in. Because at this point, Stitch has taken Adler to Verdansk and seemingly has plans to brainwash not just Adler, but rather an entire nation. Luckily though, our heroes come in and Frank Woods manages to break in and save Russell Adler. Rescued Adler faster than predicted. No matter, our work with him is done.
So at this point, we find out that the satellites are interfering with Stitch's broadcast. So his next step is to send some of his men in to take down some of the satellites around the world so he can get his broadcast out. Some of these satellites fall down upon Verdansk, but others in other locations. At this point, Adler is once again working for the good guys, but instead, he runs ahead to the crash satellite, retrieves the data, and hides it from his teammates. was that? Who's supposed to be a unit? With Perseus. Standard operating procedure goes out the window, son. <laughs> well, did we get the data recorder? No. Must have been destroyed on re-entry. You don't get the war we're fighting, do you? Stitch is capable of anything. Secure the site. So at this point, the satellites are down and now Stitch can get his broadcast out. And at this point, we see exactly what he was planning. The broadcast can then go ahead and control many different soldiers in many different ways, turning them against each other and being able to be controlled by Stitch. Similarly, we saw the same thing with Adler running ahead and taking the satellite's information, but we don't exactly know how the good guys are going to deal with it until a little bit of a closer conversation between Hudson and Woods. We've got a serious problem. Salah so said that the satellite's data recorder was destroyed on re entry. So what? I've read the report. Forensics disagree. Soot patterns were consistent with it surviving to impact. Adler made damn sure he was first there. Perseus were on site. Could they have taken it? Negative. Bodies were clean. After what happened at Echelon. We have to assume he's compromised. Fuck. Adler's been off grid working on something in Verdansk. We have no idea what he's been doing. We'll have to pull him in. Go find Mason. He knows what has to be done. And the reason why Hudson says to go find Mason is because Mason's been through this before. Once again, the deprogramming sequence. They have to use it on Adler to figure out what he has been up to in Verdansk. They do a very similar thing to what we saw in Black Ops 1 with Alex Mason, strapping him down to the chair, showing him some numbers, so on and so forth. And what they find out is that Adler has been going around Verdansk planting massive, massive bombs. Now this whole time Adler was working for Stitch and therefore Perseus, he had been putting together this plan to stop Stitch. So in other words, not fully brainwashed. And But by the time he is deprogrammed by Mason, it's a little bit too late. The bombs already go off within Verdance, which puts a huge halt to Stitch's plans. So there's one last thing left to do, and that is for Adler and our fellow heroes to go after Stitch. My life no longer matters. Do what you will. Finish what you started on Rebirth Island. My broadcast was complete. I have changed the world, Adler. In ways you can't even imagine. So from the shot of a gun, Verdansk has been exploded, Stitch has been taken out, and the story of Verdansk 84 essentially ended. But the question is, is how does that story from 1984 tie in to this? So fast forward to the year 2020, Khalid al-Assad invades Verdansk, and we are left with the question, what exactly happened to Verdansk after the Cold War? Well, thankfully, Nikolai is there to answer that question. East and West rebuilt Verdansk after the Cold War. Hey, you didn't like that cooperation. Now they've got armor, heavy weapons. Terrorists with tanks. Who's at the helm? So believe it or not, this cutscene actually takes place before Warzone was even released. We find out about Verdansk through Spec Ops and the fact that Khalid al-Assad is working with the Zakaevs as weapon suppliers in Verdansk. Now, for the next couple of seasons, we see this story continue. In season one, we have a couple of different soldiers added to Armistice, which was the soldiers fighting alongside Captain Price against the terrorists, at which we see them shoot down a helicopter which was containing gas, and as we found out, 
out, it was sent in by none other than Khalid al-Assad. In season two, we see this continue, but this time we are in Verdansk, inside the airport, and we see the first soldier that Captain Price can trust. That is none other than Simon Ghost Riley. Now, at this time, we have the scene where it zooms out over top of Verdansk, and we get our first look of a, what war zone would actually come to be. Now, at this point, we find out why Captain Price is bringing in only now soldiers that he specifically can trust. The client's plan is working. The armistice in Verdansk has officially fallen. It's bloody chaos. Tell me something I don't know. Now, at this point, Captain Price continues to bring in soldiers he can trust. Within season three, we see him bring in Alex, and essentially, this is the telling of the story of how Task Force 141 came to be and is put together. Without Armistice falling, Task Force 141 may have never become a thing. Now, at this point, I could go on to explain exactly what is going on in Verdansk. However, I believe that Captain Price can do a little bit better. This is Victor Zakayev. His father was a Soviet-era hero who wanted a world war he never got. So Victor found a willing partner to fulfill his father's wishes. Al-Assad had an axe to grind against the superpowers. He was free, armed, and turned loose. The coalition and allegiance forces signed treaties and sent in their best to restore order. But Zakayev pulled strings, sowed distrust, and divided. We turned our guns back on each other, just like he wanted. Intel says there's still a hidden world here and plans to use it. It's a bloody powder keg. Already so essentially at this point there are very few soldiers that captain price can trust but he brings in characters like gaz farah and nikolai to come together as task force 141 to stop the zakaevs from launching nukes in verdansk the other interesting part of this is during season i believe it was five they also brought in shadow company a group of paid for mercenaries to help them take down the zakaevs which is a weird move when the soldiers you are working with are currently being paid off now the reason why i bring this up is because shadow Shadow Company is set to be a much bigger part and play a much bigger role within Modern Warfare 2 and assumably also Warzone 2. Just thought I would mention that. Now, through the rest of the story, essentially what goes down is that Task Force 141 alongside Shadow Company is fighting to stop the Zakaevs and Khalid al-Assad. As we find out through the intel, Khalid al-Assad manages to escape for dance, but Victor Zakaev ends up staying behind to launch some missiles. But... Captain Price has some other plans. Show yourself. <laughs> You're wasting your time. Oh! <laughs> Victor. Captain Price. I am not surprised. You are a dead man, Zakayev. <clears throat> I started a war. Killing me won't stop it. No, I will kill you. But the fool will wait. <clears throat> All stations. Zakayev is dead with a miss of his heart. So essentially from here, Captain Price takes out Victor Zakayev and then follows it up by stopping the launch of the missile. From here, we see what is to be Task Force 141 finally come together and jump off a cliff. Now, seemingly, this would be the end of the Warzone story. However, it doesn't end there. Now, I have to make this clear before we move forward. I don't know if this part of the story is canon whatsoever. However, they did put it in the game. There are cutscenes to go with it, so we have to follow it up and add it to the story. So after the events of the story we just talked about, a mysterious ship comes on shore in Verdansk. This ship was originally intended for Rebirth Island containing Nova 6 gas. Remember when we mentioned Rebirth Island earlier? Well, yeah, it's going to come into play now. Now, once the boat comes upon shore, a scourge essentially comes over Verdansk and zombies start popping up on various locations, eventually spreading across the entire map. Now, it's important to mention that Rebirth Island, essentially all the games that you've played on it, seemingly take place during present day. Now, keep that in mind. 
As you fight here, you realize that you are fighting for what appear to be nuclear launch codes. And when you get them, by the end of the match, this is what happens. Wait! Give us a chance! You did what you had to do. You saved us all. Commander, I regret to inform you that Berdansk has fallen. Containment protocol has been initiated. Three, two, Now again, I don't know if that part of the story is canon. Not to mention that currently when you are jumping into the caldera, it states the year 2022. So again, hard to tell what is canon and what is not after the end of the Captain Price slash Zakaev era. But that is the story. That is the timeline. That is what we have for now. If you enjoyed the video, it is appreciated. Very appreciated on this one if you hit that like button. It took me forever to put this thing together. So if you enjoyed, please hit that like button, subscribe, and turn notifications on if you want to stay up to date on all of the Call of Duty story. Let me know what you thought down in the comments. And as always, thank you so much for watching. And until next time, peace out. We are, we are real.